I would like to welcome you to the topic of plant nutrient uptake. In this topic you will be learning about how plants take up nutrients. This can be referred to as nutrient assimilation. These lectures are part of the subject plant physiology which is a component of the Bachelor of Agriculture and Technology degree offered at North Melbourne Institute of TAFE. Please visit our website www.nmit.edu.au for information on this degree and other courses that we offer. My name is Dr Nikki Cooley. Nutrient assimilation is the third topic in your journey through a plant. Please ensure that you have watched Lecture 1 on an Introduction to Plant Physiology and Lectures 2 Parts 1 and 2 about root structure and function as the information and basics in these lectures will inform you for this topic. Please ensure that you have completed all the Moodle associated quizzes and readings. We will start this lecture by introducing the basic aspects of the functional roles of nutrients. We will briefly explore the importance of the adequate water in the uptake of nutrients and the role of transpiration or movement of water through a plant. This will be followed with an introduction to nutrients and the soil environment. We will spend most of this lecture studying nutrient uptake. We will look at root structure and function and how they work together. We will look into the physical and the chemical attributes of compound and solute uptake. We will look at the pivotal nutrient mechanisms they include passive or diffusive uptake, facilitated uptake, and the important process of active uptake. We will also look at the three pathways of uptake, or the three routes that a nutrient may take to leave the soil matrix solution and enter the flow. In lecture two, part one, we explored the role of water and why it was important for a plant to not only efficiently take up this solute but also that the taking up or absorbing of this solute needs to be selective. Nutrients, which will be no surprise to many of you, play a critical role in many of the plant's functional roles. This in turn impacts on all aspects of plant growth and development. In the second stage of this subject, we will be exploring in detail many of the functional roles of nutrients in plants. In fact, it can be said that without nutrients, a plant is not able to complete its life cycle. Inefficient nutrient availability or uptake, as well as excess uptake of nutrients, can result in significant impacts on growth, development, and most importantly, yield. Water and nutrient uptake are integrated and this is an important component or concept to take on board. It is important that you understand that if you have inadequate water resources in your root medium, you may not be able to take up your nutrients in an optimal manner. Higher plants are autotrophs that synthesize all their organic molecules out of inorganic nutrients. This involves the absorption of nutrients from the soil and incorporation into organic compounds essential for growth, development and yield production. This incorpor incorporation of min mineral nutrients into substances such as pigments, enzymes, cofactors, lipids, nucleic acids, amino acids. This process is known as nutrient assimilation. Nutrient assimilation is the conversion of a nutrient into a fluid or a solid su substance of the plant. The process of some nutrients such as nitrogen and sulphur is amongst the most energy consuming reactions in the living organisms. Before we start looking in detail about how nutrients and minerals are, uptake, are taken up by the plant, I thought an overview of the entire process would aid with the understanding. Roots are the location where water and minerals are absorbed. Once they are absorbed into the plant system, 
they are translocated or moved around in the xylem and the phloem. It is the process of transpiration that physically enables this movement. Water is lost to the atmosphere through the organ called stomata that's located in the leaves. Carbon dioxide enters the leaves via the stomata. Light energy is utilised to produce chemical energy with the aid of carbon dioxide. Oxygen is released into the atmosphere in the leaf system. The chemical energy is transferred into sugars. Sugars are useful for the plant as they can be used immediately as energy or they can be stored. They are stored in a number of locations throughout the plant. The most common storage organ is the root system and this brings us back to the soil environment. Carbon dioxide is released into the soil environment. Oxygen, importantly, is also taken up in the root environment. If plants are subjected to water logging, the uptake of oxygen can be compromised. In the lecture today, we are going to concentrate on the soil solution, root hair epidermis, root cortex, and uptake of mineral nutrients. So to review the basic facts on solute transport, when stomata are open, the plant is transpiring and solutes move from the soil into the root. It is important that you remember that a plant needs to be respiring for this process to occur, as it is an important and integrated component of the mechanism. Solutes are then transported to the centre of the root in the region called the steel, and we will look at this process in more detail. Where they, when they reach the steel, they will then reach the structure called the vascular bundle. The vascular bundle contains both the xylem and the phloem. For most nutrients, transport occurs in the phloem, while water is mainly transported in the xylem. Which <coughs> vascular bundle, either the xylem or the phloem, is used will depend on the physical and the chemical properties of the solute. You learnt about the Casparian strip in Lecture 2, Part 2. It is an area on a cell wall which contains a compound that ensures that the loss of solutes from the root does not occur. Another important basic fact is that the process of nutrient and water to uptake is under tension. We were introduced to the concept of water potential in Lecture 2 and like the uptake of water, water potential plays an important role in plant solute uptake. Water potential can be used as a measurement to dictate how efficiently water can be taken up. This in turn can relate to the efficiencies of nutrient uptake. From your DIY practicals, Essential Reading and Lecture 2, the following images of a root structure should be familiar to you. Figure 1a is an image of the cross section of a root, while figure b is a detailed concept drawing of the main structural components you need to be familiar with. You will note the epidermis, the cortex, the endodermis which contains the important Casparian strip which stops nutrient loss, the steel where the xylem and the phloem structures are located. Nutrients will only enter the root at the root hair, unless the root is very young, where they may be able to enter at the root tip. The structure and the architecture of the root can alter the rate of nutrient uptake. So nutrient uptake is similar to that of water uptake and was described in lecture two. The nutrient is taken up by the root hair and it needs to take a root from the soil solution into the steel. 
There are several pathways or journeys that it can take to get from the soil solution into the steel. The red line on, on the two images here show the concept of where the nutrient pathway has to go. Water potential and the components that make up water potential play a key role in solute uptake. Nutrient hairs increase the surface area of the root and also increase osmosis. If the water potential is more negative within the plant than the surrounding cells, the nutrients will move from higher solute soil concentration to lower concentration in that of the plant. These concepts were first introduced in Lecture 2 and also apply for nutrient uptake as well as water uptake. Nutrient uptake is more complicated than water uptake. Water uptake tends to be facilitated by simple diffusion, while nutrient uptake involves three physical processes. Physical diff uh, simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and active transport. We will spend the next slides discussing these three different mechanisms. Simple diffusion or passive transport. This slide is a review of the process as we followed this in some detail in lecture two. It is a spontaneous downhill movement of molecules. Please look at the image on the base of the slide. On the left hand side you will see a depiction of a high concentration of molecules or nutrients which is above the lipid biolayer bio or cell membrane. Below this is a low concentration of nutrients. Passive transport can only occur when this is the situation. The molecules follow the concentration gradient. That is, they start to move from the extracellular space into the intracellular space. This means they move from outside the cell through the membrane into the cell. Their movement is described as passive. There are no transport proteins involved and no energy involved. This process will continue until equilibrium is reached. This is, di 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 this is shown by the right hand slide of the image. You will see that there is equal number or equal concentration of nutrients above and below the cell. Once equilibrium is attained, no more passive transport can occur. The process of diffusion described in the previous slide from high concentration to low concentration is explained by Flick's first law. This law states the movement of molecules by diffusion always proceeds down a gradient of free energy or chemical potential, potential until equilibrium is reached. Let us define osmosis. Osmosis is the diffusion of water molecules across a selectively permeable membrane. The net movement of the water molecules through a partially permeable membrane from a solution of high water potential to an area of low water potential. You will note that you first came across Frick's first law from lecture two. Now let us explore facilitated diffusion. Facilitated diffusion is similar to diffusion, but there are some subtle differences. It is the rapid movement of solutes or ions forming a concentration gradient, which is facilitated by the transport proteins. The following image is illustrated facilitated diffusion. You will see in the cell membrane proteins. You will also note that the images on the slide shows the molecules moving through the protein channels as they are called. This is a very important component in nutrient uptake. The following image shows a number of proteins located in a membrane of a cell. In fact, there are many. The chemical and physical composition of the solute to be taken up will determine which protein is used by the solute. 
In this lecture, we will only introduce the concepts here. But in stage two of this project, we will explore these interactions in much more detail, specifically those of nitrogen and sulphur. At this stage, the ideas that you need to take on board are simple. That is, that it is a rapid movement of solutes, that the movement of solutes occurs along a concentration gradient, and that this movement is facilitated or helped by transport proteins, which are protein structures embedded in the cell membrane. The final concept that you need to take on board that is very important is that this process requires a lot of energy. In fact, you can get loss of hydrogen ions to the soil, and it is a complex mechanism that we have made simple for educational purposes. And finally, the last mechanism we will explore is that of active transport. Active transport can be defined as the movement of substances against a gradient or chemical potential. That is, it's an uphill movement. Where the chemical potential of any solute is defined as the sum of the concentration, electric and hydrostatic potential. That statement encompasses the chemistry and the physics of active transport. The direct use of energy to transport molecule across the membrane. So let us look at the basics of active transport. The figure on the slide will help you to understand this. The nutrient from the extracellular space will travel into the intracellular space with the aid of energy. The image shows this journey. A nutrient will start above the cell in the extracellular space and the aim of the plant will be to get this nutrient into the intracellular space. This is summarised by point number one. Point number two to note is that this is going to be difficult for the plant as it will involve the nutrient travelling against a concentration gradient. Therefore, neither passive or facilitated diffusion can be employed. The nutrient will travel into the protein and then out of the protein with the aid of chemical energy compound adenosine triphosphate. This is usually abbreviated to the three letters ATP. It is an exceptionally useful compound to the plant and is produced during the light reaction of photosynthesis. These proteins are embedded in the cell membrane and are highly sophisticated. And this is encompassed with point number three. It is the chemical energy compound ATP that allows the protein to be pushed or forced into the intracellular space. I use the word force because it is against a concentration gradient and hence the requirement of energy. A byproduct of <clears throat> this movement is that ATP, adenosine triphosphate chemical energy compound, is then converted into adenosine diphosphate or ADP. The proteins used in active transport that are embedded in the cell membrane are different to those used for facilitated transport. Most of these proteins are enzymes that perform the transport and they are called transmembrane ATPases. This terminology or name encompasses their function and the fact that they require energy in the form of ATP and this may help you remember this term. A component of the transmembrane ATPases is that there is a sodium and potassium pump that is used by these enzymes. They use this to help maintain the cell potential as you are moving compounds against a concentration gradient. The redox or photon, which is a measurement of light energy, may also be used 
in active transport systems. Please note we have only reviewed the basics of this mechanism and there are more complexities that we will not study in this subject. So the sodium and potassium pump is used in active transport. Potassium ions accumulate passively. Active uptake when external potassium is low. Sodium act activity is pumped out of the cytosol into the extracellular space and the vacuole. Excess proteins actively pumped from the cytosol. Ions are actively taken up into the cytosol. And the compound calcium is actively transported out of the cytoplasm. Are you still confused about the differences between passive, facilitated and active transport mechanisms? If so, it is advisable to watch the following video, Absorption by Root, Active and Passive Transport. Please only watch the first three minutes, as, that, as the concepts covered in the first three min minutes are relevant to this topic, while the rest of the video is not. The graphics in this video will show you how passive and active transport works and you will be able to differentiate between the two. It may be worth you watching it several times and then reviewing the lecture notes to understand the differences. The link is available on Moodle for your convenience. So to date in this lecture we have learnt about the three mechanisms which are used for the transport of nutrients. These mechanisms are utilised in the uptake of nutrients from the soil matrix and are involved in various components along the route to the phloem. Different routes of nutrient uptake can occur, as we described for water uptake. The route will determine which mechanism of uptake is employed by the plant. The chemical, physical and energy requirements are also a driver of both the route and the mechanism employed. In lecture two, we introduce the concept that water can travel through a plant by one of three routes. This is also true of minerals. A mineral can travel out of one cell, across a cell wall and into another cell. If it takes this route, it is called the transmembrane route. A nutrient may travel by the symplast route. The symplast route is the continuum of the cyto cytosol connected by the plasmodesmata. Or a nutrient may take the route along the apoplast route. The apoplast route is the continuum of the cell walls and the extracellular spaces. These three routes are shown on the slide in the image. The apoplast route is, dip, is shown in pink, while the symplast route is shown in blue, and the trasmo, transmembrane route is shown in green. It is worth spending some time learning these three different routes. The following slide shows the important components of the symplast route to note. The symplast route is through the cytoplasm. Solutes enter the root hair and travel across the partial permeable membrane by the process of osmosis. The solute will then move from a higher water potential in the soil to a lower water potential in the cell. Solutes will move across the root from the cytoplasm to cytoplasm down the water potential gradient. A solute will then pass from one cell to another via the plas plasma, plasma desmenta. Solute moves into the xylem via the process of osmosis. The only way across is the endodermis. This is normally the most important pathway for nutrient uptake. The important concepts of the apoplast route were covered in lecture two. It is important to differentiate between the symplast and the aplast route. The apoplast route typically is in, 
travelled by water and much less commonly by some nutrients but the availability or access to nutrients via this route will depend on the physical and the chemical structure of the nutrient. Solutes move through the cellular wall and the intracellular spaces. The permeable fibres of the compound cellulose do not resist the most solute flow. Solute cannot pass into the endodermis by this route due to the caps caps capsarian strip which contains the compound serberin and this is impermeable to water and solutes. Therefore, the structure of the root ensures that all solutes pass through the endodermis via the cytoplasm and therefore this dicta dictates cellular control. Remember, A per plus root is predominantly travelled by water when transpiration rates are high. It is fast and, importantly, requires no energy. This diagram is a useful diagram as it explains the lateral transport of minerals and water in the roots and it summarises many of the concepts that we have already been introduced. The two roots, aplastic and symplastic, are shown on the figure on the slide. The aplastic root is shown in pink, while the symplastic root is shown in blue. Each of the numbers describes the functional role of each component at each stage. So, for example, Number one describes the aplastic root uptake of soil solution by the hydrophilic walls of the root hairs. This provides access to the aplastic root. Water and minerals can pass through into the cortex along this matrix of walls. Point number two describes the symplastic entry. Minerals and water cross the plasma membrane of the root hairs and enter into the symplastic pathway. Three, as the soil solution moves along the aplastic, some water and minerals are transported into the protoplasts of the cells of the epidermis and cortex and then move inward via the symplast. Stage four, within the transverse and the radial walls of each endodermal cell is the caps, caps, Casparian strip, which we have been introduced to previously and this blocks the passage of water and dissolved minerals both in and out of the plant. Only minerals already in the symplast or entering that pathway by crossing the plasma membrane of the endoderm cell can detour around the Casparian strip and pass into the vascular cylinder as shown on the figure. And five, the endodermal cells and also the parenchyma cells within the vascular cylinder discharge water and minerals into their walls, called the apoplast. The xylem vessel is the transport for water, while the phloem vessels is the transport for minerals. And this allows transport of both water and minerals into the shoot system. The soil environment is a complex mixture it is a mixture of the physical components of the soil, as well as water and dissolved nutrients. But it also is a living thing. Part of the living component of the soil is a group of organisms called mycorrhizae. I'm going to introduce mycorrhizae here, and we will be exploring them in more detail in a tutorial. Most plants form mutually beneficial relationships with fungi and these facilitate both the absorption of water and minerals from the soil. This is a fascinating area of study and there is still a lot of details we do not understand. Roots and fungi form what's called mycorrhizae. These are symbiotic structures consisting of a plant's roots united with fungi hyphae. A symbiote is a process where the activity is beneficial for both partners. In this case, the symbiotic structures are beneficial to both the fungi and the plant. 
White mycelium of the fungi around this pine root, as shown on the figure, provides a vast surface area for the absorption of water and minerals from the soil, and is just one of the reasons why this relationship is so beneficial. There are two essential readings for this chapter. The Taze and Zeiger, Chapter 5, Mineral Nutrition. Please read the start of this chapter and all sections up until the roles of essential elements and nutrient disorders. This will include sections such as the plant root system and its interactions with the soil, soil and minerals, mycorrhizae fungi and their association with plant roots and finally the section on essential elements and techniques for growing plants in nutrient studies. In this chapter you will learn about the root systems and the interaction with the soil, mineral root entry and mycorrhizae associations. The second essential reading is from this text and is found in chapter 12, Assimilation of Mineral Nutrients on the section of water absorption by the root. In this section you will learn about nitrogen, sulphur and oxygen assimilation. Make notes on these two readings and add them to this part of the lecture to complete the information required for this topic. I'd like you to finish off this lecture by watching the following video, Plant Nutrition and Transport. This video will review some of the mechanisms and transport routes discussed in this lecture and it also introduces the mechanism of the vascular transport systems. The vesc vascular transport systems, that of the xylem and the phloem, will be the topics of our next two lectures in this subject. This brings us to the end of this lecture. In summary, you should have had an understanding now of the role of nutrient uptake by roots. You should understand that it is quite a complex process and that it involves a mixture of mechanisms and roots. We have looked at the three fundamental mechanisms that plants use to move and take up compounds. These are passive, facilitated and active uptake. All of these mechanisms are dependent on the physical and chemical concepts a nutrient can travel three different routes from the soil matrix to the transport vessels, the phloem. We have learnt about these routes and how they differ from one another. While learning about these routes, we learnt how important the structure is, both in the function and in the uptake of nutrients. We have also been introduced to the concept that nutrient uptake can be aided by other organisms such as the mycorrhizae. Finally, to finish this topic, please ensure that you watch the video stated, that you do the essential reading and make notes and add to your lecture notes, and that you complete lecture 3 quiz. This will enable you to determine if you've understood the topics and content of this lecture. This is the end of lecture three.